The Sony ZV-E1. A lot of people have been crowning this the baby FX3. Well, it just so happens that I happen to own both cameras. We're shooting on the FX3 right now. So let's go over the big differences, my experience using both cameras, and a bunch of test footage. First up are the bodies. The FX3 is clearly the better built camera here. Better grip, two SD card slots, both of which support type A cards, a built-in fan, full-size HDMI, quarter 20s everywhere, tons of buttons to customize, more dials than the ZV-E1, and a better flip screen on the FX3. But the ZV-E1 is much smaller, lighter, it has a built-in mic that's actually usable with a nice little Need to brush this hair. Nice little usable windshield, which the FX3 does not have. We only have one SD card slot on here and it doesn't support type A cards. We have one dial on the whole camera basically, not including the back wheel. A micro HDMI slot, which honestly, it could have been a mini. I could deal with a mini. Minis, mini HDMI isn't that bad, but micro, come on Sony. Both cameras do have some advantages over the other when it comes to build quality, but the winner in this category is definitely the FX3. But what the ZV-E1 lacks physically, it more than makes up for on the software side of things. That is where the ZV-E1 shines, my friends, shines. With less custom buttons on here than usual, Sony made up for it with some nice touch controls that I really like. I'm a big fan of them. Swipe to the side and we got a bunch of on-screen controls here that I wish were customizable, but I do use the majority of them, so. I'm not really that mad at it. I use the on-screen record button when the screen is facing me. Subject recognition target, which pretty much just lets you switch between your different autofocus modes on what type of subject you wanna focus on, whether it's humans, animals, birds, insects, trains, planes, automobiles. I think that's it. Insects. There's a zoom button on here, which we'll come back to in a second. A play button to check out your recordings, a mode button because there's no physical mode button on here. Kind of wish that there was. I feel like we could have squoze one in somewhere. Luckily, you can set one of these custom buttons to be your mode button, which is what I did with this background focus deep blurring option here that I'm never going to use because I just adjust my aperture manually as I see fit. So I set that button to be my mode dial. That way I can switch between my custom settings really quick on the fly 24p60 120 when it comes in a firmware update. There's also a control on the screen for your onboard microphone, which is pretty cool. You could switch between front facing, rear, all around and automatic. And below these side menus, we have touch controls for your exposure settings on the bottom. And you could touch to adjust everything, your ISO, your shutter speed, your aperture, and even your white balance, which I personally love. One of my favorite new additions to the ZV-E1. Been waiting on that from Sony for a long, long time, ladies and gents. I'm just gonna leave that in. And guess what? My FX3 doesn't have any of that stuff, and I'm pretty sure that we're not gonna be getting too many more firmware updates for the FX3. This is probably the final one. 3.0 is probably the final one. I hope not. I hope we get some more features, but I can't see another firmware update for this camera, to be honest with you. The FX3 can load custom LUTs, but so can the ZV-E1. The FX3 finally has focus breathing compensation. So does the ZV-E1. The ZV-E1 has the same autofocus system that the A7R5 has, which in my opinion, is the best autofocus system on the planet at this very moment, regardless of camera maker. Don't get me wrong, the FX3's autofocus is phenomenal. It's incredible. It's still one of the best in the game, but the ZV-E1 is much better. The FX3 really can't recognize anything on its own besides the human face, really the eye. And if that human face turns around and the eye isn't visible anymore, the FX3 doesn't recognize the rest of the subject like head, arms, back, back of the head, pretty much whatever, but the ZV-E1 does. This camera is gonna do its best to grab onto any body part that it thinks is human just to make sure that the subject is still in focus. And it's great, it works great. Now we'll get to the stabilization in a second, but I did mention the zoom button on the on-screen controls of the ZV-E1, which basically just controls clear image zoom, which is nothing new to Sony cameras. Sony has had clear image zoom for years now. But using that button, you can punch all the way from your widest to your tightest with one little tap. You don't have to 
gradually zoom in. And now with the ZV-E1, we have an updated version of clear image zoom, which my FX3 doesn't have. I think the only two cameras at the time of this video that have it are the ZV-E1 and the A7R5, and I'm sure any future Sony cameras that come after the ZV-E1 are gonna have it as well. They better. Which is that you get to keep all of your autofocus functionality while zooming in with clear image zoom, which is great. Everything. I autofocus, touch the track, nothing changes. The FX3, it loses all of that functionality once you punch in even just a one little hair with that clear image zoom. I autofocus, touch to track, everything, everything that you could think of pretty much goes out the window, which again, it sucks. And I think that that is a feature that they could easily add to the FX3. And if we do get another firmware update, for this camera, I really hope that that's in there because that's one of my favorite features of the ZV-E1 by far, might be my favorite. It makes clear image zoom so much more useful, whereas on my FX3, I barely use it. On a ZV-E1, I use it all the time. Now, when it comes to stabilization, both of these cameras have active steady shot. And in my opinion, active steady shot works really well. I'm happy with it. But the ZV-E1 now has a new stabilization mode called Dynamic Active Steady Shot, which does crop in 30%, but it works fantastic. It's almost GoPro level. It's almost GoPro gimbal level. And if you walk straight in a straight line and you walk steady enough, do a ninja walk, it is gimbal like. All right, here's the onboard microphone on the Sony ZV-E1, and we have the little windshield on there right now, which is, pretty great i mean it's not the most amazing microphone in the world but to be able to have a decent quality sound in the microphone and have some kind of wind protection right on the camera and not really have to worry about an external microphone it's pretty nice especially if you're pretty decent at cleaning up audio in post now we're set to all directions i can come here on my on-screen controls i could tap and we could switch to the rear so right now you shouldn't be hearing me that well because the microphone is recording from behind the camera, but I just tap it again on my screen. And now we're in auto, so now we're leaving it up to the ZV-E1 to decide where the audio is coming from. Hopefully it's picking up me from the front. I would never really depend on this. I would click it again, boom. Have it right in the front, facing me. And we got ourselves a nice little compact mini vlogging setup no real extra tools needed and now we have the sony shotgun mic on here i always forget the name it's the bcm1 this is what it's called this is the best one that they make there's a few other versions a little smaller a little cheaper this is the oldest one and the best one and to me honestly i have done a ton of microphone tests in my day and i have probably 100 microphones in my house as far as shotgun mics go for me personally this is my favorite sounding one straight out of microphone, camera, whatever. It's amazing, love this thing. All right, now we're on the ZV-E1. Now we still have a lot to go over here, but before we do, something to think about is no matter what kind of gear you're shooting on, it's important to add key elements to your projects to spice them up a little bit and make them be more professional. And the best place to find everything you need for your video is by far Artlist. Artlist has an enormous library of high quality, royalty-free music and sound effects, and their search tools make it super easy to find exactly what you're looking for and get right back to your project as fast as possible. All the music that you hear on this channel comes from Arliss and that's because they're the best and I was a customer long before they supported me and this channel. And if you're looking to step your game up a little bit further, we now have Artlist Max, which still has the high quality music and sound effects, but also offers things like high quality titles, stock footage, motion graphics, templates, plugins, a video editing app, and a photo editing app. Arliss has made it so that you don't have to go to a bunch of different places and try to hunt down all the little things that you need to make your project complete. It's all under one roof and extremely affordable. Guys, do me a favor, stop searching on YouTube for the same limited royalty-free music that hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people have used before you. Just click the link in the description below and start your free trial right now. And by using that super special, super special link that I left for you guys down below, Artless is gonna add two free extra months onto your subscription, which is a fantastic deal. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Artlist, for sponsoring today's video. Next up are two features that I thought were kind of gimmicky at first when I first saw them, but after having some time with them, 
I think that they're actually pretty damn useful, especially for content creating. And that's auto reframing and framing stabilizer. Now, both of those features use the new clear image zoom that I just mentioned a minute ago. Auto framing is meant to be used while the camera is still, like on a tripod. And framing stabilizer is meant to be used while in motion. Let me show you guys auto framing. All right, so we have auto framing turned on right now. And as you can see, it's tracking me around. It's doing a pretty good job. I move to the left of the screen. I move to the right of the screen and you can see it's pretty much keeping me in frame and doing its best to track me. And with framing stabilizer, you have incredible stabilization and the ZVE-1 will keep your subject in a certain part of the frame, either the center or you can choose custom and put it wherever you want. Rule thirds, whatever you want to do. Now, the big thing that everybody's worried about for some reason, and it gets more attention than any of the amazing features that I just talked about in this video, is the overheating situation. For some reason, that just always becomes the biggest focal point of any camera that has any type of overheating issues. Now, for the FX3, this thing has never once even come close to overheating and i've shot 13 14 hour day weddings with this camera 4k 60 4k 120 highest bit rate settings never even crossed my mind that this thing might overheat because the fan in this camera does a really good job does what it's supposed to do on a zve1 i've never personally had an overheating situation myself i was just out shooting today 88 degree weather super hot super humid out shot for like 45 minutes straight had no problem with the camera now i've never done a stress test on this camera to see if i can make it overheat because that's not really my thing i just picked up the camera shoot how i normally would shoot with any other camera for whatever shoot i'm shooting it's a lot of shooting and I've never had a problem once. Now I'm sure it does overheat because a bunch of my creative friends that do have this camera have done those stress tests and they've gotten it to overheat. But on an everyday normal usage, I've never had it overheat. And the most stress that you could put on your camera during a wedding shoot is during the actual ceremony. And as a wedding shooter, I have to capture the entire ceremony from start to finish. People walking up the aisle, finish up the wedding and people walking back down the aisle. And in a situation like that, I'm always gonna use my Sony FX3 because I know for a fact I'm never gonna have an issue with it. I wouldn't even take the chance of using the ZVE-1 because if it fails on me, then I'm out of luck and then I gotta run and grab my FX3. So that would be the one situation during a wedding shoot that I would have to insist that I use the FX3 over the ZVE-1. But I still am gonna use the ZVE-1 along with my FX3 for wedding shoots, just not in situations where I have to use this camera for super long periods of time. Which again is basically only the ceremony. The rest of the day is usually start record, stop record, start record, stop record. And in a situation like that, the ZVE-1 is good. The FX3 is definitely the more professional camera between these two. I mean, it's Netflix certified. You could literally shoot an entire Netflix movie on the Sony FX3 and maybe get it on Netflix if Netflix don't think it sucks, thinks it don't suck. But if you're just a content creator or a casual shooter or anything like that, I'm finding it really hard to recommend any other camera in the industry right now at this very moment over the ZVE-1. It's pretty hard to beat and it's half the price of the FX3. Let me know in the comment section below how many of you guys picked up the ZV-1. Are you thinking about it? If so, what's holding you back? Is it the overheating thing? Let me know down below. If you're not subscribed, please do so. I'd appreciate it highly. Thumbs up, click that little notification bell. Do whatever you want. Share this video to the whole world. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you all for sponsoring today's video, and I will see you guys next time. Yeah!